what I think you really need if you're going to have the two different kind of plays is two different playbooks. An NFL team has different playbooks depending on the team they're playing against and depending on the weather conditions. So, you know, at Rick Early, we tried to kind of have a one size fits all playbook that just wasn't driving, you know, a consistent repeatable process for enterprise. So what we did was build another dedicated sales playbook. What was harder going international or going up market to enterprise? I think going up market to enterprise. And again, so with full story, we had a, a great team and we already had a little bit of momentum. So that made it a lot easier. Hi, Adam. Thank you so much for being here. Excited to chat all things sales and go to market and playbooks. Before we dive in, would love to get your quick intro of who you are. Yeah, it's great to be here. My name's Adam Carroll. I've spent over the last decade building and scaling SaaS sales teams at companies like Outbrain, Recurly, Full Story. And as you can imagine, that involves everything from building the sales process, in some cases, expanding into new regions, expanding up market. And more recently, I've taken that experience and launched a sales coaching and consulting business. So I work with SaaS startups, help them fine tune their sales process, put in place training and development for their teams. Congratulations. Very, very exciting. So, so Adam, how would you define a sales playbook? Yeah, that's a good, good question. So th there's a couple of answers for me for this question. So a traditional sales playbook and what I've seen at a lot of companies is a really large detailed document that includes, you know, all the information about go to market, ideal customer profile, sales process, you know, and a whole lot of more stuff, a whole lot more stuff than that. And to me, that information is is necessary and it should be documented. But the, the problem I have with those more traditional kind of, you know, really large sales playbooks is they're just not very actionable or, or digestible for the sales team. So what I think something like that should probably be called a, you know, a sales and marketing manual and, you know, it's there for reference oh, yes. and it should be documented. But I think what's, you know, much more effective is having a sales playbook be something that's, you know, really clear and really simple. And it guides the team on, you know, who, who your customer is, how you're going to get in front of the customer, what their problems are, and then how to, to add value or create value in your conversations with that customer. And I think if you can distill that into something that's simpler, something that's coachable, you're going to have a lot of, a lot more success rather than, you know, a really thick folder that's sitting somewhere gathering dust. Yep. I was just listening to someone else's answer to this and what they said was, you know, a lot of companies have piles of paper and it's a huge booklet for a playbook, but what you really need is a one, two page summary of how do you find customers and then how do you close customers and how do you make that repeatable? Exactly. So the amount I of some, that. Yeah. The amount of like 120 page PDF sales playbooks I've seen. I recently in talking to kind of consulting prospects is, is crazy. Yeah. So tell me when you were at Recurly, you joined both the product led growth motion as well as an enterprise sales motion. So tell me a little bit about what a sales playbook looks like when you have both PLG and enterprise and what it looked like at Recurly. Yeah. So for Recurly, you know, the, the, the company's DNA or bread and butter had been in that product-led growth, install base, SMB type customers, and they had a really healthy, you know, several thousand customers. And before I got there, they had, you know, they'd made inroads into going up market and going into enterprise, but it, it just wasn't, you know, super consistent. It was a little bit hit and miss. And, and as I came into the role and kind of, you know, did a scan and, and saw how things were happening, I could see that the, the playbook that they'd had originally was great, really thoughtful, really well put together, but it was for that PLG motion. And they'd made tweaks and they, you know, added stuff on as they tried to go up market. But what I think you really need if you're going to have the two different kind of plays is two different playbooks. And, you know, an NFL team has different playbooks depending on the team they're playing against and depending on the weather conditions. So, you know, at Recurly, we tried to kind of have a one size fits all playbook. 
that just wasn't driving, you know, a consistent repeatable process for enterprise. So what we did was build another dedicated sales playbook around enterprise and going up market. And as I mentioned before, something that was really a, a lot more simple, crystal clear and, and actionable by the sales and marketing team. So what challenges should folks run it, be prepared for if they have to build two of these different playbooks, one for PLG or what we say product-led sales, as well as one for enterprise, or if you have a hybrid motion? Yeah, and I, I think that there's going to be overlap, of course. Like you don't want to do two completely separate things on different planets that, you know, that aren't aligned at all. So you still need to have strong alignment, strong feedback loops, you need to have shared goals across different teams and across the two different sales motions. So that that's a challenge in itself is having those things. I think one of the other challenges is product prioritization. So, no, you know, no. at companies I've been at, like I said, there's a really healthy install base of many, many, you know, thousands of small customers. And then, you know, you're trying to target a much smaller amount of large enterprise companies. So, you know, how do you determine who to build the product for and, and what to have on your product roadmap? And at Recurly initially, we'd been kind of doing it by gut feel and anecdotal. So the challenge there is getting really strong data and having a well, data-driven approach. And fortunately at Recurly, we had a great product and, and technical team and a strong sales and marketing team. So we were able to really get aligned and dive into the data and see you know, look at our existing customer base, look at the existing enterprise base, look at what's in the pipeline and start to quantify, you know, where we should be placing our bets in terms of product. And also once those, you know, product evolutions are rolled out, what impact did they actually have? So that's a huge challenge. I think it, another challenge that isn't spoken about as much when you, you've got this hybrid approach or you're trying to move from one to the other is a cultural shift. So, you know, I've been at companies where we've had a superior product for enterprise than our competitors, but we just weren't perceived as an enterprise player. So that needs to start internally with the culture and making sure that, you know, everyone's aligned on, hey, this is the direction that we're going. And then of course, externally, your website, marketing, sales material, and especially how you kind of pitch and your talk track with customers needs to be, you know, if you're going, you know, up market needs to be at that level because it's, you know, it's how you're going to be perceived. That's something we think about and talk about a lot in the focus community that doing, starting out as a product-led growth company for s and and moving, adding on a sales motion and being more data-driven and then driving enterprise. It's a product shift. It's a go-to-market shift. It's a culture shift. And I'm assuming even documenting the way you sell and that culture was that part of the playbook it was I, I mean I'm I run a coaching business now and that's always been something that's been really important is is coaching like you, you never want to just you know whatever the playbook is just give you know your sales team a playbook and say hey go and read this and and start doing it so coaching is really important but it's especially important when you're trying to drive a cultural shift and you're taking, you know, salespeople or SDRs or demand gen people who had been focused on one area and now they're talking to a completely different set of, you know, of prospects and customers so that the, the coaching and consistent coaching, not just one off is our, you know, we're going to do some training around the, the playbook and the sales motion. So yeah, having that coaching as part of the, the company DNA. So we talked a little bit about building out the sales playbook when starting out with PLG and how do you go more up market and enterprise. Another really interesting playbook development opportunity that I heard from you was building out a playbook to expand to a new region. So when you were at Full Story, you were hired to do this. So I'd love to hear how do you how do you develop the strategy or the playbook to expand to another region? Yeah, and and at Full Story, I was originally hired to run enterprise sales for, for the West region in the US. And then during the interview process, they heard my accent and decided that we've got this small team in APAC that we're trying to expand. Can you deliver a, an expansion strategy? So I, I loved working on that. But the playbook for expanding, you know, globally is is very different. You know, obviously there's, again, 
product considerations that'll keep coming up and having to localize the product. But I think the biggest challenge when, when you're going into a new market is actually the, the sales process. So for example, certain countries in Asia have a very formal sales process with a lot of formalities along the way and you can only talk to certain people as you get to certain stages so you know you need to be prepared for that you need to build a sales process around that even in you know other com countries like Australia and New Zealand I'm seeing over the last couple of years a quite a conservative approach where even on deals that aren't that large there's often an RF you know a very formal RFP process so you know that involves different resources internally and again a different different sales process so there's those things this one's an obvious answer but when you're going into a new region people are absolutely critical and even before I'd arrived at full story we had a you know a, a foundation team of about four people in Australia covering that region and they were excellent and that just made the expansion so much easier because they could operate autonomously they knew the market they had good partnerships and all that kind of stuff so what are what was the biggest challenge beyond trying to figure out who are the right people and what are the different sales processes country to country? Are there any big kind of hurdles you wish you knew before? I think one of the ones that that I've seen, you know, I'd seen it before and, and you know, it'll happen again is that the U.S. companies, you know, U.S. is a huge market, right? And a big country or big region. So when... U.S. companies go into other regions, often they think that the credibility that they've established through, you know, a success in the U.S. and the clients and the case studies is going to translate. But someone in, you know, Sydney, someone in Madrid, they don't, they're not familiar with, if you reference Best Buy or Wells Fargo, or they're not familiar with these country, with these companies. So that, that doesn't translate. So one of the things that happened really well at Full Story is we had local, some of our foundation local clients were willing to do case studies and all that kind of stuff. So we built up those referenceable customers and case studies very quickly. And that gave us a really strong foothold in the market where I've seen it also happen the other way where you haven't had that. And, you know, it takes longer to build that trust and credibility locally. That is such a good point. And it it sounds obvious when you say it, but ahead of time, I'm like, oh yeah, that that is something that definitely seems hard and something you have to be very intentional about. Yeah, which and I'm you sure need to, a lot of people don't think through. Yeah, and that plays into things like pricing because you need to think about, all right, do we take yeah. on a couple of customers that you know we're gonna you know provide some pretty heavy discounts or incentives so that we can get um, you know case studies out of them. So yeah, there's a whole whole range of, of different things that, that you need to think about going internationally. What was harder, going international or going up market to enterprise? I think going up market to enterprise. And again, so with, with Full Story, we had a, a great team and we already had a little bit of momentum. So that made it a lot easier. And, you know, initially the focus in APAC was on Australia and New Zealand and then Singapore. So culturally and language wise, they're not that far away from the US and then you know as we continue to build out into you know further places that's when the the kind of localization piece gets a bit trickier but yeah going up market i think it can be a lot more complex all great insights any final thoughts on sales playbooks i think yeah one thing that that didn't come up yet is that sales playbooks should be and, and you know you can make them they should be measurable and again, it goes back to having great data, but it's one thing to build this great playbook and say, hey, let's go and do these things and this is how we're going to go to market and sell. But there's all these different moving pieces within the playbook. So, you know, you need to be able to assess and see, you know, what's working and what's not. And, you know, that, that can be very simple and obvious things like, you know, the ICP and the targeting, but it can be more nuanced things like, you know, in the sales process, are we getting stuck at stage three for enterprise? All right, let's let's look at that. Are we, you know, demoing too soon because we've come from like an, an SMB mindset and we need to spend more time, you know, validating the use case and getting engaged with the right people. So, 
you need to have, and this is really tricky, but you need to have a way to measure like all those different pieces of the sales playbook, which ones are working and which, which are not, and then be able to kind of pivot and adjust as you go. So I think that's, that's yeah. critical to a sales playbook being rolled out successfully. A hundred percent have the data to figure out where do you lean in more and what do you have to completely say, you know, what, we're going to iterate and move on. So I, yeah. I definitely agree with that. Oh, go ahead. And I think on that note, that's one thing that as you go up market as well, when you're, you know, in PLG, you know, you, it's high velocity. You can get data very quickly and make decisions with, you know, going up market into mid market and enterprise, there, there's a much longer sales cycle. So there's a much longer lag time before you're actually getting solid data that you can make decisions off. So you need to be aware of that and you need to be able to put in place, you know, KP, shorter term KPIs and leading indicators yeah. so that you can start to pivot sooner rather than waiting six months to realize you, you know, you're going after the wrong audience or you're selling in the wrong way. What are those leading indicators? That's a good question. I mean, I always like, I'm, I'm more very, you know, sales focused and enterprise. So I'm looking at the different sales stages and how quickly you're moving through them and what are the things you're doing at each sales stage and having data on that. I think, you know, looking at the different audience segments or, or ICP segments is really important as well. You know, at Recurly at one point, we got really excited about you know, online wine and alcohol companies. And we were getting, it was really easy to generate demand and generate leads. So we kind of put, you know, too many eggs in that basket and then only found out a few months later that they weren't converting. And even when they were, they weren't large deal size. So, you know, having some of those indicators earlier rather than later is, is definitely going to help make better decisions. Yep. It's such a good point. You can't, if you have a six month sales cycle, you can't wait six months to make decisions. You need to figure out what are those KPIs that we can be tracking ahead of time to make sure we're leaning into the experiments that work and leaning away from the ones that we just think are not going to take us very far right now. Yeah, absolutely. So that, that makes a ton of sense. Adam, I learned so much playbooks for going up market, playbooks for expanding to new regions. Just general thoughts on go-to-market strategy. Uh, really, really appreciate your time, your perspective, your insights. I'm excited to learn more about your consulting practice and get all of your tips and tricks there as well. Fantastic. Well, I've really enjoyed this too. Thank you so much, Adam. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for having me part of it. Bye.